On the 28th of November 2020, I went for a hike up a mountain called Kadaridris in southern Snowdonia. I was promised beautiful views from the summit out over the sea and the surrounding mountains, including Snowdon itself. Once we got above 400 metres, however, we were hiking in thick, thick fog. So dense that you could barely see 10 metres in any given direction. And everything became damp. The air felt thick but cold to breathe, and once we climbed nearly 500 metres more in the fog, we reached the summit, desperately hoping that there would be a view. And there was, for about two seconds. Oh, no, no. <laughs> there it is! Look there! Oh! As we began our descent, I and the rest of the team collectively felt rather disappointed, but not for long. After descending the first around 100 metres, the fog suddenly began to clear in chunks. We'd be plunged into dense fog before suddenly being graced with a view stretching kilometres out over Snowdonia. As we walked along the ridge further and further from the main summit, we got a spectacular outsider's view of what we'd been hiking through. The fog tightly suffocated the main peak and rolled down the northern flank like the thick steam dry ice gives off when dropped into water. Whilst the rest of the team consulted a map, I tried to stand as still as possible to record this time lapse. If you look closer, you can see the fog rolling down the mountain. And then on the 27th of January 2021, I was out on my daily exercise when I came across this. A dense fog, around two metres thick, clung to the surface of the floodwater. I could see miles above the fog, but only maybe 30 metres through it. And it's these two peculiar encounters that have got me quite interested in fog, what it is and why it happens. The first thing to clear up is the definition of fog and how it differs from mist and haze. So fog and mist are water droplets suspended in the air with the difference being that fog is much thicker than mist, with a visibility of below one kilometre. Haze is the odd one out, and is actually tiny dry particles suspended in the air, which can lower clarity in views over very long distances, and are partially responsible for the red skies at sunset and sunrise. So how does this fog form? Well, both types of fog that I'm going to look at today are caused by this warm, moist air cooling and expelling its moisture. Warm air can hold considerably more water vapour than colder air, and so when the warm air cools down, it eventually reaches a dew point, the temperature at which it has to expel its moisture. It reaches 100% saturation, and it's this temperature that air has to cool to in order to form uh, fog. And this is why frost uh, normally forms in the night when the air cools down. If air rises, a drop in air pressure will cause it to cool in a process known as adiabatic cooling. Adiabatic cooling is one of those processes that's quite easy to say and accept, like adiabatic cooling means that as air pressure decreases, air temperature also decreases. But it's one of those processes that's a bit more difficult to actually understand. But it goes something like this. Imagine you have a pocket of air with a certain amount of energy and therefore a certain temperature. There is an air pressure acting on this pocket of air and keeping it the size that it is. If you then lower that air pressure, the pocket is able to expand. And although the expanded pocket still has the same amount of energy as the compressed pocket, it is spread out over a larger area. So if you look just at the amount of space that the air took up when it was at high pressure, you can see that the energy in that amount of space is lower so the temperature of the air is lower. And this is exactly what was happening on that mountain back in November. A gentle warm breeze was blowing into the southern flank of the mountain, where it was forced up to higher altitudes, where the drop in air pressure caused it to cool. As it cooled, the moisture condensed onto condensation nuclei, which are particles suspended in the air, forming suspended water droplets, which we see as fog. Processes relating to mountains are often given the term orographic, so this fog is called orographic fog. 
As the orographic fog was blown with the air to the other side of the mountain, it followed the topography, the slope of the mountain, and sank, where the increase in air pressure allowed the air to warm up again, and the water droplets evaporated, dissipating the fog. Orographic fog will only form like this and flow down the opposite flank if the wind speed is gentle enough. Stronger winds can create a different uh, phenomenon known as banner clouds, which are actually caused by lower pressure in the turbulent shadow behind the mountain, cooling the air, alabiatically again, to form clouds that stick to the downwind side of the mountain. So that explains the fog on the mountain, but what was causing the fog on the floodwater? Well, this fog wasn't caused by an air pressure change, but rather the cold water in the floodplain. The previous days had been very cold. We had lots of snow and there had even been ice forming on the floodwater, indicating just how cold the water had become. As water takes so much longer than air to cool and heat up, the water remained cool when a warm front moved in, bringing with it warm, moist air. So to outline the process from the beginning, you start off with a river. Then you have a prolonged period of heavy rain, in this instance Storm Christoph, which causes the river to rise and flood. The air then cools to very low temperatures, which remain for a few days and nights, allowing the water to catch up and cool down too. Then, moist air starts to gently move in, and as it does so, it transfers energy to the cold water, and so has a decrease in temperature itself. As the air was already at 100% saturation, only a small temperature change was needed to take that air to its dew point and cause that water to condense on the condensation nuclei, forming suspended water droplets which we see as fog. As the warm air was advecting over the cold surface, this type of fog is called advection fog. And note as well from this diagram that it's, it's only the lower portion of the air that cools enough to form the fog, which is why I could still see the tops of trees stretching for miles. Eventually, if this process were to continue, the water would have warmed up sufficiently enough to reduce the temperature gradient, so that the air stops transferring energy to the water and therefore stops cooling down, allowing the fog to dissipate. So there we go, that was an insight into two different types of fog and the processes that form them. And of course there are lots of different types of fog, um, and they all sort of are caused by slightly differing uh, situations and circumstances, but the general principle is this warm air reaching 100% saturation. So that's all from me, I will leave you with this video of my friend walking in front of that orographic fog up on Kader Idris last year. I tried to stand as still as possible to record this time. Goodness sake. Sorry guys, I'm just gonna evacuate.